So first of all, I would like to thank Sophie for inviting me to this uh, very unique place, very unique location that I'm very happy to share tonight my passion with you. So my key driver as a scientist, but also for art, is passion. I think I would not be able to do my work without the passion I have. The lead motif that's going throughout my work and which I try to share with my students and researchers is thinking out of the box, being open for serendipity. And a message to you tonight, a take home message I hope, is that you give some space to randomness and imperfection in your life because you will see how important it is. So what was my first passion? My first passion was tennis. When I was a little child, I played a lot of tennis. I got selected by the Tennis Federation, and then you end up as a promising little girl in the Le Soir, <laughs> winning also at the time against Justine Nena. But she ended up first of the world in tennis. I didn't end up first of the world in tennis. But that's OK. You will see that I took on a very different route. And Luckily, this was not my only passion. And one of my other passions was, in fact, understanding what is cancer. So I lost a friend at a young age who died from cancer. And when I started to read about cancer, then you can see that it says it's an evolutionary process that results from the random accumulation of somatic mutations. And so it leads to an uncontrolled cell division. And I was really struck by these words, an evolutionary process and randomness. And so these were one of the reasons that I started to study biology. But not only that, but also as a child, I loved to look into biology books. And what I was really striking by was these different kinds of adaptations, these animals that can survive in the most extreme environments or flowers that do mimicry to attract insects. There are so many examples of amazing adaptations out there. What's also striking me in nature is this complexity. We evolve to so many complex forms, and a very beautiful example is our brain. If I would take all your nerve cells out of your brain, I could do 25 times the circumference of Earth. And if we look at all the connections in our brain, then each nerve cell is 2,000 times connected with other nerve cells. So we have more than 200 million million connections in our brain. This is so much more connections than any computer we will ever be able to build. And then just look at the diversity around it around us. At microscopic level, at macroscopic level, there is this huge diversity that has adapted to this very different environment. And what's really interesting about all this is that all this evolved from one unique ancestor, Luca. Luca, the last universal common ancestor, 3.5 billion years ago on planet Earth, gave rise to all the diversity, complexity that we see today. And in fact, Luca was a very simple cell, probably like a bacteria. And if you look at this simplified tree of life, we sometimes think, wrongly, that evolution is going towards a climax, and that the climax is human. But this is wrong. It's completely wrong. Evolution goes in very different directions. Very different. Branches occur, some disappear, and we are just one of these branches of evolution. And we are, in fact, the last second of evolution. We are very recent. We are not 3.5 billion years ago. Homo sapiens evolved around 300,000 years ago out of Africa. And in fact, we are lucky to still exist because our ancestors persisted, because these ancestors survived, because if you look, when we separated around six to seven million years ago from chimpanzees, so we share with the chimpanzee an ancestor around six to seven million years ago. When we separated, there were very different types and species of humans arising on our planet. 
but all got extinct. And the only one that remains today is Homo sapiens. Very recent, like I said, 300,000 years ago. And if we think about this, then let's think it even, even broader in a longer evolution. Let's put it back in our universe. So if we look at our universe, it's around 14 billion years old. Our planet Earth is around 4.5 billion years old. Maybe in five to six billion years, the sun will disappear. So our life, a human life of average of 80 years, is just a small, small spotlight in this long evolution. And if you think that we are just this very small spotlight in this evolution, like Daw Dawkins said, Richard Dawkins, some of life must be devoted to do something worthwhile with it, more than just perpetuating it. And I realized that for me, what's really important or worthwhile is science. And we can ask the question, what is science? What is the use of science? And this is a question that was already asked by a minister to Michael Faraday in the 19th 18th, 19th century, so a chemist physicist from England. And Michael Faraday answered to the minister, what is the use of a baby? And the minister looked at him, surprised. And he says, science is like a baby. When it's born, it can do nothing. But it has a huge potential. So when we scientists write an hypothesis, we don't always know the out outcome. When we ask answers, we don't have the end. When we ask questions, we don't always have the answers. But there is a huge potential. And that's sometimes difficult for people to invest in something where they don't see the answer right away. And still, that's the importance of fundamental science. The enterprise of science is about answering questions about what is this universe? What is life? Where do we come from? So we try to look at universal scientific evidence without barriers, religious barriers, geographical barriers. So scientists are part of our society. And I think today with COVID, people realize it. These initiatives like today, Science and Cocktail, it's important you realize it because it's very important that once you understand something, you can act accordingly. And that's something I often like to say to politicians. Try to understand it so you can act accordingly. Because let's go back to this diversity. This diversity around us has evolved since more than 3 billion years. This is a long evolution of species interacting with each other, forming this ecosystem. And this ecosystem becomes more and more complex the more species start to interact with each other. And each interaction is critical. And so if we start to destroy one or some parts of this network, the whole thing could collapse. So it's really important to understand these ecosystems and to, once we understand them, to really protect them. And what's the problem nowadays, what we often see is that what we scientists often call the sixth mass extinction of the Anthropocene, is that we start to have huge impacts on these ecosystems. And if you're interested in this, there is a very interesting website by uh, Sebalos and other scientists of this top extinction where we really see that there is this biodiversity issue. And it's because we just, by interacting with some aspects of the network, we can have huge collapses going on with these horrible images sometimes. But what I want to come to is that these kinds of collapses are happening. They are sometimes happening, and we should be aware of this. And also what we have nowadays. We have this pandemic. And what's important to understand in the pandemic is not only the aspect that we all know is what is the virus, the impact on us, the impact on other people with the vaccine, etc. But what I often want, would like to discuss more, and that's what I why I brought it in today, is that we need to understand the entire story of the pandemic, and so also where it comes from. And if we look back, 
what we realize is that there is this huge trading of wild animals in China. So more than 100 million wild animals are traded every year in China. It's a huge business. It's around $7 billion of trading happening there. And the problem is that when you start to take these wild animals out of their ecosystem, so they, these ecosystems are in balance since millions of years, some thousands of years, but this balance to happen in an ecosystem takes time. It takes time to construct a balance. So if we take these wild animals, we take everything out with it. Also, the viruses, the bacteria, everything that it's hosting inside its body. And the problem is that we can create these viruses and bacteria that starts to mix with other systems, like human, that are not adapted, that are not part of this ecosystem. And in fact, if we look at several pandemics that happened, then we see a repetition of things that are occurring. And one of these repetitions is that it's always a transfer from wild animal to human. So if we look back at HIV, then we see here there are two important strains of HIV in our human population. And we're talking here in the 1980s. Eh? So these two strains are still present in our population. HIV-1 is the most virulent, so it's causing the most of death in human. If we already see here in a simple phylogenetic tree, we see that HIV came several times from mangabees or from chimpanzee to, to human. So there has not been one transfer from the virus to human, but several. And if we look even more into HIV-1, then we see that there are different groups found in human because the virus evolves inside the human population. And what we see is that there are, again, some of our strains are closer to gorilla, they're the virus of gorilla. Others are closer to different chimpanzees. So it really shows that we had several transmissions from chimpanzee or mangabe to human. We need to question this, this relationship between human and wild animals. And then if we look at the coronavirus, oh, oh, that's a pity. This slide is not coming up. I don't know why. Maybe it will come up. So what we see is that in 2002, we had the first virus, SARS virus, coming to human. This was a, from a civet cat in China. We had again a transfer in 2008 from MERS, so from camel to human. And then 2019, we had this first transmission from COVID to human. Every time, we don't know the origin, probably it could be pangolin or snake. We are still not clear about which are the, the, um, the host between the um, bat and human. But every time we see that it's a transmission from these wild animals to human. So it's very important when we discuss about this pandemic, when we discuss these scientific aspects, is that we realize the entire story. That we not only look at the consequences of this pandemic, but also at the origin. So that we can also question the origin to prevent it. And so that's why it's important that we scientists talk about also the other aspects, the entire story of a pandemic. But let's go back to Luca, to this evolutionary question. How do we know that we all came from this one single cell 3.5 billion years ago? It's because we all share the same DNA code. So whatever you look at, a virus, a bacteria, a mushroom, a plant, an animal, or humans, we all have the same DNA code, these four chemical blocks, the building blocks of life, only four. The four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, tyrosine. And if we look at our genome book, then we see that we have around three billions of those letters. So in each of our cells, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and on these chromosomes, we have all these letters. And these letters define who you are. And between you and me, on average, we have around 
1,200 to 1,300 letters that will differ. And so the question is, it shows that, that the genetic code is universal. That means we are all related. So we are all related to this one cell 3.5 billion years ago. But then you can question a simple cell evolving to so many different forms, complex forms, like I showed you in the beginning. How did we evolve? And that's I, what I always say, the beautiful, the central dogma of molecular biology. Biology can be so complex, but also so simple or so beautiful. Take your DNA, so you take again your chromosomes, any, any organism in its cells has the same, same nucleotides, the same building blocks of life, the DNA. This gets translated by a machinery working very similar in all these cells of any living organism, translating it into RNA. You probably know in the meanwhile that COVID is an RNA virus, so its genetic material is RNA instead of DNA. But in most organisms, DNA is the genetic material. And then the RNA gets transcribed to proteins, and proteins are the workers of your cell. And they are doing all the functions, they are showing who you are. And I'm not gonna detail uh, here a biology course of the machinery, but what's beautiful is that this is the universal genetic code that is used by all living organisms on our planet. It's the same universal code. And so three letters of our DNA give one piece of the protein through a little machinery where it passes through RNA. And so every piece, every three letters creates another piece and these pieces are put together to create this protein. And these proteins are critical to the functions of our cell. But then how does evolution happen? What can happen is that these letters start to change randomly. They change all the time. Every time our cells start to replicate, we make errors and these letters can change. We can be exposed to chemicals or other or radiation. These letters can change. That's what we call mutations. And so what can happen is that these letters change. The consequence is that a piece in your protein can change. And often these changes are neutral. And a lot of what is happening in evolution is the consequence of neutral mutations. But sometimes a change can be adaptive. And when that change is adaptive, it will be selected for. And that's if you give time to evolution, you get all these random changes happening constantly. Some will be deleterious, but some will be advantageous. And if they are advantageous and they give a fitness advantage to your organism, it will be selected. And so thanks to that, thanks since more than 10 years now, there is this genome revolution where more and more technology has advanced very quickly to start to sequence all these genomes at a very low cost. So it's also possible nowadays to sequence your genome for less than 1,000 euro. And you know all the letters of all your chromosomes. And then we can come start to compare humans where we all differ in our letters and how we are different from each other. And that's the whole idea behind the Thousand Human Genome Project. So there has been more and more human species, uh, human individuals, sorry, sequenced all over the world. And then you get this kind of map. So what does this map show? The colors show unique mutations, so in dark, mutations, so changes in these letters that are unique to the population. These are, in yellow, are the, uh, the light part of the color are changes unique to the continent. And the gray part of the pie chart is show showing mutations that you share. So the same letters that you share between populations or continents. So what you clearly see from all these analyses is that the most unique mutations are in Africa. And that makes sense, because we all evolved. The oldest individuals of Homo sapiens were in Africa. And we all started out of Africa to migrate all over the world. So the most variability 
because the longest evolution is in Africa, we see the most variations there. And then you see that Europe is much younger, that there are populations that are much younger, that have less unique variations than other continents. But that the biggest part is this dark gray is all this shared variability. So having this data, it's also interesting to look back a bit at our human society, to use these scientific results to also questions about discussions we have in our human society. For example, the whole questions of defining a race. We often say there are these Asian people, European people, Americans, Australian. But it's based on what? Because if we look at the genetic maps of all these what we call races, then we see that there is so much variability within a group, as much as between groups, that it's very hard to delimit what's an Asian, what's an American, what's an European, based on their genetic information. So biologically, a race doesn't mean much. And we should be very careful. This is really a social construct, not a scientific construct. And maybe some of you have already done the test where you, where you dec decipher your genetic ancestry. So you get your genome analyzed and you try to look based on these variants, these mutations I showed you, what's your genetic ancestry. And what you will see, any individual that will try to find back its ancestry, you will see that you are European, Asian, probably also Africans, all kinds of variability. So what is an immigrant nowadays? Because if we would look at our genetics, then we are a mixture. And we are all immigrants out of Africa. So again, the terminology immigrant could be questions if we look at a worldwide level. And that's the interesting thing about this genomic revolution, is that we can decipher more and more this variability that is underlying the variability that we see at the phenotypic level, so at the outside. We also have to look at the inside. But the genomic revolution is also not only interesting for all these evolutionary scientific questions, but also for the medical field. What we know now more and more is at the origin of cancer, there are these random mutations. Mutations that can occur in genes that control our cell divisions, or in genes that suppress these uncontrolled cell divisions. P53, a very important gene to control your, our cell division. If that gene gets mutated, there is uncontrolled cell proliferation, and a cancer can occur. But also genes that control cell death or DNA repair, all genes nowadays, we get a longer and longer catalog, a list of mutations that could be at the origin of cancer. And of course, this is very interesting insight information to better understand this, um, this um, disease and to treat it. But I'm not gonna talk today so much about cancer. Still, we wonder, is cancer a human aspect? Are we the only one having cancer? No, not at all. There are many animals that develop cancers, a lot, because we all have cell divisions, and if the cell divisions get uncontrolled, you can get a cancer. But I showed you there are beautiful adaptations out in nature. So are there animals that do not develop cancer? And could we learn something from these? This is the naked mole rat. Very cute, no? <laughs> this naked mole rat doesn't develop cancer. So it's as small as a mice, but instead of living four years, it lives 30 years, which is already surprising for such a small animal. But what's really interesting is that it cannot develop a cancer. So scientists started to ask this question, how can, how come? And of course, when they asked the questions, they had no answer. And they had to start, in the beginning, they started, it took like more than 10 years of research to realize by looking at something very different, at tissue elasticity, they realized that these animals secrete this high molecular mass hyaluronin. It's a molecule a bit sugary-like 
that they secrete around their cells, and it makes their tissue very elastic. And this helps this naked mole rat to dig into the soil and to really go there in between the soil and that all their tissue is very elastic when they go inside the soil. But what they realized is that this molecule also prevents cells from dividing more. So they secrete this hyaluronin around their cells. And when you inject a cancer there or any other cell, it stops dividing. It cannot divide further. And that's, of course, very interesting now for applications or for further research towards this cancer therapy. But why do I show the naked mole rat? Because it's just one of these examples of nature as an inspiration source. Albert Einstein always said we know less than one thousandth of one percent of what nature has to reveal us. And so I think, and that's while I am inspired by nature, is that nature took so long to evolve, this ecosystem took years, millions of years to evolve. And so in nature, you can find so many answers to questions we have. Nature has found solutions to survive in the most extreme environments. They have found solutions to not develop cancers. So let's respect our nature and let's study it. Let's understand what are the other species we are living it, and let's learn from it. And so the second part of my talk will be about one of these organisms that we are studying in my research group that we are interested in, and I will explain you why. Let's start with this. This is a lichen. A lichen is already a very interesting system. It's in fact a symbiosis of cyanobacteria and yeast living together. So these organisms have to live together, they are dependent on each other to form this lichen. This lichen we can find everywhere on our planet Earth. It's very widespread on rocks, on trees, everywhere. What's surprising is these lichens, they can be completely dry, sometimes they are humid, and you would be surprised what a rich diversity of organisms are living in there. And one of these organisms are the rotifers. What you see here is a rotifer, so wheelbears. They are characterized by the cilia that rotates on their head. Here is their digestive system, and on both sides you have their reproductive system, the ovaria. What you see here is a microscopic female, less than one millimeter, so this is 200 micrometer on average, and it's only females. So there are no males ever found. And this is an interesting organism because it was already described by Van Leeuwenhoek when he created these first microscopes. And he was not only interested by these organisms, these, what he called wheel viewers, but he was really surprised by them. So he started to study them a little more because he had taken some leaves from a rain gutter of his house. He added water to it. He would take lichen in nature. He would put other water on it. He would look under the microscope and he would always see these rotifers. And why? Because these females, besides evolving without males, which is already a bit a, an evolutionary scandal, because you wonder, if you clone yourself, how do you create variability? And we know variability is essential to evolution. But they can also dry up at any stage of their life cycle. So these females, when there is no water in the environment, they dry up into a little ton. All the cells lose water. So the metabolism is completely stopped. You can keep them dry for years, you can even freeze them, put them in your freezer at minus 80. You take them out, years later, you add water, they live again. So we are dealing here with an evolutionary scandal. And why is it an evolutionary scandal? For us evolutionary biologists, we often say sex is the queen of problems in evolutionary biology. Why? Because if you look at sexual reproduction, it's somehow a complex system. You need a female gamete and a male gamete to meet each other, to form descendants. Males often, or females, have to develop strategies 
to attract the other one. This is really energy consuming. You can transmit diseases. There are so many aspects of this sexual mode of reproduction that you wonder, why should we not all do like these ratifers? Just a female, that creates a new female. No hassle about finding another male, about trans giving only half of your material. You just give your, all your material to the next one. So also the advantage of colonization. If you want to colonize a new environment, just one female is enough. So why, if you look at the animal world, even the plant world, why is sexual reproduction so dominant in, in this mode of reproduction? And asexual reproduction is very rare. The underlying answer is probably creation of genetic variation. As I told you, one of the important mechanisms for evolution is genetic variation. Look at COVID virus that evolves. It's constantly creating these variations, random variations. But if a variation is advantageous because it enhances its growth inside our cells, it gets selected. But still, how do the rotifers evolve? Because rotifers have evolved into more than 400 species. So they diversify. They diversify since millions of years in more than 400 species. And they adapt to these extreme environments where they can dry up, they can be frozen. So of course, this makes the newspapers, they love these kinds of stories where you can reproduce without males or without sex. So one of the first questions, I will try to explain a bit of the results. What are we on trying to understand here with these organisms? So one of the first things that we tried to unravel in my laboratory was to look at how do they really reproduce? Because when you form gametes, so we all form gametes, all the animals do, what we do is we, the females make an egg cell and the males make a sperm. All the animals do like this. This is universal for all our sexual reproduction. And to make gametes, there is this one universal process that is called meiosis, is a process where you give half of your chromosomes to your egg cell or to your sperm. And it's important to give half of it because afterwards, after fertilization, you mix everything together to make a new descendant. So how do they do? So we looked here, you see this rotifer with all his nuclei, nuclei where his genetic material is colored in blue. So here you see each of its cell with the DNA colored in blue. And what you see here are the reproductive system of this female, and here you see the oocytes. So these are the female egg cells inside these females. And we see that it can lay an egg where it gives its DNA, the egg starts to develop cell divisions to make a new individual. So what we try to study is the chromosome dynamics, what happens from the DNA here, the chromosomes inside here, is everything given to the descendants, or do they only give half of it, like all other gametes are formed? So without going too much into details to not lose you, but what you see here is the dynamics of their chromosomes. They have 12 chromosomes inside their egg cells. Like we have 46 in each of our, of our cells, but we have 23 in the egg cells for the female, 23 in the sperm. So we see 12 chromosomes that starts to condense, typically in meiosis. At some point, they start to come together. We only see six chromosomes. That's when your homologous chromosomes come together. And then through a mechanism of very specific meiosis, you have the chromosomes that beautifully separate into two, and you give only half to the egg cell and half to an, uh, another cell that gets destroyed. What they do, we found out, is that they give their 12 chromosomes to their descendants. So they do, at some point, that's what we call an aborted meiosis, this separation of the chromosomes into two cells does not happen. So now we try to understand the molecular mechanism behind this stopping of this separation. So they keep all the chromosomes of the mother together. And so they don't need any sperm or any other um, genetic material to come in because they give everything to their descendants. 
So we are really dealing here with an organism, a female that can clone himself, that gives all its chromosomes to the descendants. But then you think, how do they evolve? How do they create genetic variation? So let's go back to their life cycle. They live in these environments like lichens that dry out frequently, and they can survive drying. But what does drying do to your genetic material? So what we did in the lab, we can clone them very easy. You take a female, a few months later, you have thousands of individuals, a clone of the mother. And then we dried them up in the lab, and then we started to look at the integrity of the, their genetic material. Do the 12 chromosomes stay intact, or does something happen? And if drying up breaks up their genetic material, do they repair it perfectly afterwards, or do they create changes at that moment? And so we started to look at this. So we took an hydrated clone, we dried it up, and we looked at the genomic integrity after several periods of drying up. And what you see here is that instead of having your genetic material up here, so your chromosomes entirely kept intact, you see that the DNA starts to break, to break into pieces. And when you rehydrate them, they start to repair their broken DNA. So these animals are capable, when their chromosome starts to fragment during drying up, to put back all the pieces together to recreate their 12 chromosomes. And we thought this is interesting and it's very unique because what do we do when we do proton therapy on cancer cells is that we expose these cancer cells to radiation because this ionizing radiation breaks up all your genetic material into pieces and the cells die. So that's what we do in proton therapy, is exposing cancer cells to this ionizing radiation to break up the genetic material so they die. So we thought, let's expose this animal to ionizing radiation. And what happens then? So when you, we expose them to ionizing radiation, this is proton radiation to more than 1,000 gray. This is huge. There is no living organism that can survive such high doses of radiation. The only exception is a few bacteria, like Deinococcus radiodurans. So we expose these ratifers to these huge doses of radiation, the DNA gets completely broken. But when we rehydrated them, they all survived. They had a huge survival rate. So they can come out of desiccation, ionizing radiation with broken DNA and survive. And if you let them repair, after a while they start to repair their broken material. And we even looked inside the cells, and we could see that within the 24 hours, they start to put back the whole puzzle of their chromosomes together. And this is, of course, interesting, but then we thought, okay, but they can repair their DNA. But remember the question, do they repair perfectly, or do they create some variability? So we did another experiment where we did again, we dried them up, we irradiated them, and we looked at the descendants. What happens to the offspring? Because these oocytes that I showed you inside the female, they get irradiated, DNA is broken, but they need to repair it before they can make descendants that are viable. And if we look at the descendants, so here you have the mother, and you see the different chromosomes of the mother, she gets irradiated and desiccated, so her DNA is broken. If we look back at the descendants, so she starts to repair when she comes out, she lays eggs. We look at the descendants, they start to re have all the same chromosomes back together as the mother. But now with genome revolution, we thought, let's look at the genetic letters there. Remember, there are four letters that make up the entire alphabet, the same one as us. Are they exactly the same? And so, not to go too much into details, the really cool thing with this animal is we can just make a clone genetically the same. We can keep it for 100 generations in the lab, so we kept it for a very long time in the lab, and then we decided after all these generations, we sequence the genome again to see if there is changes happening. Do they evolve? Are there mutations? Are there changes happening? And we did another experiment in the lab where we dried them up, where we irradiate them, and there we took the descendants of these females and looked 
are these descendants really the same at a genetic level at these different letters? And so what we did is we took all the DNA, so these are two years of experiments in the lab where you create all these lines, and then you take all the DNA, you sequence it, and nowadays, luckily, it's cheap to sequence them, and then you create a reference genome. So what is it? We created the genome of the first mother we used. So we reconstructed the 12 chromosomes of this mother. And then, after 130 generations of evolution, or after desiccation of outer radiation, we took from the descendants also the DNA, and we also reconstructed their chromosomes. And then we compare. We compare, do these descendants have the same letters at any position as the mother, or are there differences? Now, I'm gonna, not going to go into the bioinformatic details, but this is how the chromosomes look like of the mother. So we have each letter along the chromosomes of the mother. So once you have the 12 chromosomes from the end to the end, you can compare the descendants. And what we see, and I'm not, this is very recent results, we didn't even publish, and don't try to understand everything, just what you see here is when there are no changes with the mother. Here you see there are no changes with the mother. The more dots you have here, these are all the changes compared to the mother. So what do we see is that when they dry up, and after drying, changes occur. So the individuals after drying are not the same as the mother from the start. The same when you irradiate them and you create DNA breaks, they do repair, they do reconstruct their chromosomes, but they are not identical. And in fact, perfection is the end of evolution. If they would repair perfectly, then maybe they cannot evolve. So maybe this desiccation is critical for the evolution. So in fact, you, they can tell us, you replace males by drying up, and you evolve. So we don't need males. <laughs> but then let's, there is much more to discover, of course. And so I got um, a big grant for the from the European Research Council to start to study, because for me, there is a question that's and maybe you have it the same, is how do they do this? How do they survive drying, freezing, or repairing their broken DNA? And there are many questions there, and I can unfortunately not go into detail of each, but we started to look at the antioxidants. Because you have to know that since oxygen is present in our atmosphere, we create in all of our cells radicals, oxygen radicals. And these oxygen radicals inside our cells, they attack our DNA, they attack the proteins, and you know if your proteins don't work, or your DNA is broken, the cell will, not with the water fur, but in all the other animals, the cell will die. If there are too many damages, they die. When you expose animals or water to drying or to radiation, they create a lot of these radicals. So how do they do? So at the moment, we are looking at all the antioxidants to understand how they survive drying up. And we are also looking at all the mechanisms to understand how do they so well repair their DNA. And so what we do is, again, we look at all the radicals that are formed during drying up, and then we start to analyze all the antioxidants that these organisms have developed. And we found some very interesting um, results here that we are now analyzing further of very specific antioxidants. They seem to upregulate to protect their proteins because it's very important they protect their proteins because the proteins are the ones that repair their DNA. If the proteins are damaged, they cannot repair their DNA after desiccation, they would die. And so what we are now also trying in the lab, and that's a slide that doesn't come up, what you would have seen here is a microscope with needles, because what we try now is to develop the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So you probably heard about it, the Nobel Prize from um, these two ladies, 14 years of research, where they discovered they were looking at the immune system of bacteria. So yes, bacteria have an immune system, to protect themselves against phages. 
It's a very beautiful system where the bacteria takes the DNA of the virus or of the phage, integrate it into its genome, and then and, and the second time it gets attacked by the same virus, it can recognize this piece and start to send a protein to destroy it. And that's the whole CRISPR-Cas9 system. And so what it does, this protein, this Cas9 of the bacteria, goes to a very specific place, it recognizes, and it cuts at a very specific position. So it really recognizes these letters where to cut. So this is now revolutionary to the field of research of biology and of the medical world. Because now what we can do, if we want to understand if the, which are the important actors of the repair system of rotifers, we can study the function thanks to this system. We can just, with Cas9, taking the Cas9 of bacteria, giving it the sequence of our rotifer of interest with the Cas9 and say, cut there or create a mutation. Your gene is inactive and you can see if it has a consequence. So in the rotifer, we use this system to try to see which are the actors of the repair machinery and of the antioxidant protection, which is really important for applied applications. And now we have deposited a patent because we found some really important actors that can enhance um, tolerance of these organisms. And so you immediately see here that going through evolutionary biology, being a totally fundamental scientist, I'm going back indirectly to these whole questions of cancer. Because we have here, the Rutifer, a very interesting model system to better understand cancer and aging. Because they do not have a P53 gene. We all have a P53 gene, Rutifers do not. And it makes sense, because the P53 is the gene that says to our cell, if our cell has too many damages, it goes into cell death what we call apoptosis. And it's very important so that our cell is not going into an uncontrolled cell division. Rotifers experience constantly damages from their environment. If every time that they have damages when they dry up, they would go to cell death, they would never survive. So they have no P53 gene, so they don't do any cell death. So in fact, they are a living cancer. Because when P53 is mutated in our system, we develop a cancer. So they are living cancer with this immortality and they have found a way to protect their proteins from damages from drying up or from ionizing radiation. And that's why this animal became a model system for space research. So we have sent them now twice to space. And why is it an important system? Because in space you have a lot of galactic cosmic radiation. This galactic cosmic radiation includes ionizing radiation. And I showed you, ionizing radiation is creating damages on your DNA. So if NASA and ESA plans these long missions into space, this will be a huge problem to astronauts, is this galactic cosmic radiation. So we did send the first experiment in 2019. This was the first model we built at Kennedy Space Center. So I was working there with uh, technicians and scientists of my lab, with engineers of Kaiser Italia. And here you see the first model of Rotifer sent to space. And in each bag, we had 10,000 individuals. So this is a very good system because you can create many, many replicates. You have clones. And you can do the same experiment on the International Space Station and on Earth and compare them and see what's the impact of the space environment on living system and on their DNA compared to Earth. And so this was here a very exciting moment where they bring our experiment to the um, SpaceX shuttle. This was a collaboration with scientists, engineers, but also artists. And this was the launch in 2019. This was a very special moment because I did a postdoc in the States. I brought these rotifers back to Europe to study them and I went back to the US to send them to space. So it was a unique moment. So we are analyzing the results of this data. And here you see our experiment that was taken care of by this astronaut, Luca Parmitano. Um, last year, we could send a second experiment to space. And this one is a very exciting one. 
So we constructed with Kaiser Italia a model, and this model is of different pieces, and what you see here is where we put dry to rotifers. So what we did is we dried to rotifers in the lab, we exposed them to ionizing radiation. You all know now that their DNA was completely broken. And then we put this patch with 1,000 rotifers here. So there we put this little patch of rotifers dried up with a genome completely broken. We closed the model, and here we add the recipient for water. And so we had a few of those models going to ISS on the 6th of December last year. And the same models with the same clone was kept on Earth. And at the same time, they were rehydrated. And the question here is if they can repair as well their broken DNA in space as on Earth. Because we don't know when astronauts go to space and travel long missions there, if their metabolism and their repair system is still active. And so now we got this experiment back, and it started in February, March 2021, and we are creating all these lines of these descendants of the space mission, and we are going to analyze their genome from the experiment in space and on Earth to compare the impact of radiation. And to just finish, I would like to say, if you look at our keywords in science, these are very important words when we do research in a lab. In fact, I could put the same keywords for art. And so what I did recently is started to create a symbiosis between art and science. Like Marie Curie would say, sans la curiosité de l'esprit, que serions-nous? And so what the aim is really to work together with different disciplines to create a cross-pollination of knowledge. And our first and I'm very pleased to say it tonight, it's the first time that I can announce it, is that we got a grant from InnoViris. So I'm inviting artists from very different disciplines since three years in my lab to interact with scientists and to reflect on our research. We have this research on rotifers, on immortality, on cloning, on space. This opens many questions to artists and to our society. And so we created these interactions between art and science, creating artworks related to our science, and we, get, we got the funding to create a first exhibition named Manned Flight, Rotifers in Action, that will take place next year at Pilar at VIB. So you're all very welcome. And what we will show there is the first artist that joined is Angelo Formule from the Seeds Collective. So he came to Kennedy Space Center to add an artwork that would go with our experiment to space. But the only spot he could receive from ESA is this one. So on each bag with, of our experiment, there was a little square here where there was a bit of space, and he could put an artwork there. And what he did is he added a fingerprint cut into an X on each of these bags that went to space. And the artwork is called Engines of Eternity, and I will not explain it all here tonight. You should come to the exhibition. But this artwork is evolving, using also artificial intelligence, to integrate our scientific data to have all these fingerprints evolving, integrating our scientific data. And so they create drawings out of all these fingerprints, but also this integration of our scientific data into the evolution of their data creates slowly this kind of sculptures that will be printed and exposed. The second artist we are working with is Gerlando Infuso, who makes stop motion animation films. He has made a movie of Rotifers in Space that we will show the first time at Pilar. The third artist is Marc Guillaume. He's a photographer. He has been interacting with us on all these um, things on picturing our experiments. But what he is interested in, and this will be part of the project, is to create a fiction of surrealistic relationships between people that, so, that normally never interact with each other. So he puts in his pictures, in his photographs, scientists with a veterinary, with military people, with a lawyer, and they start to make the new laws. So it's a whole fictive, surrealistic uh, story that's also around Ratifers, but I will not tell all the details here, that we will expose. And the fourth artist integrated into the work is David Bader, 
who is an artist that does participative sculptures with the young ones. So he will create with the young ones a crazy lab like he did in Hienk. He will do at Pilar a laboratory, a biological laboratory together with the people who will participate. And so I would like to enter, you can all become a partner uh, by sponsoring, by anything you want, because art and science is marvelous, but as long as we should not live from it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.